let's uh, let's talk about uh, a few things I wanted to share with you about the legibility of your handwriting before we uh, hand it over to Heather, and I'll I'll try to squeeze it into twenty minutes or so. So basically, what we're going to uh, look into is I call those the legibility dysfunctions. And I know that uh, many of you guys are very good at handwriting. So you probably don't need, uh, you don't need some of the simple things I'm going to share with you, but some, some do. So just, just the ones of you who feel quite confident and secure with handwriting, use that as an opportunity to maybe uh, reconnect or um, just uh, look at the things from a new perspective and uh, yeah, disregard that if you, if, if you feel it's too basic for you, but hopefully you can find something for yourself anyways. So the first thing first, um, we need to create a baseline, something to compare. And in order to create a baseline, I'm going to ask you to do something for me on a piece of paper or digitally, whatever you prefer, write down a pangram that you can see now on the screen. And by the way, can you see the screen? Can you see me yeah. doing stuff? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Pangram is a sentence that has all the characters of a certain alphabet, in this case, the English alphabet. And the intention is to make the sentence as short as possible, but keeping all of the characters uh, present. So this particular uh, sentence here, when zombies arrive, uh, quickly affects Judge Pat. It's one of those uh, sentences. And uh, I really checked there are characters, all of them. So for the baseline, try to write down in your handwriting using all the capital letters, um, um. approximately like one finger high in, in large, uh, letters, but also capital ones, uh, write down this pangram. I'll keep it here so you can still read it while I'm doing the exercise myself. So, when zombies arrive. We fix so once you're done, you have a sample of your handwriting with all of the characters captured, and we will use that uh, to analyze any deficiencies or dysfunctions you might have and in order to, uh, to, to have something to work with, to analyze. So that's your sample. And then a few words about how people read. When, when we write down a word, let's say a word apple, what happens is that when a person looks at that word, and tries to read it in order to understand what is this about. It's interesting to know that we are not reading a character by character. So we're not like reading the first letter A and then P and then another P and then L and then E. And then based on that, we kind of combine the word. It's not how it works. We are not reading analytically in that sense. What happens instead is that we see a certain pattern and that pattern is then fed into our recognition system. And then inside of our brain, what is happening is that this pattern is then matched against a library of different patterns. And then once we find the one that we have, inside of the memory and there is a match. So it clicks like, okay, that's the one. Then our storing system understands that 
we know that this word is, is you could say, um, a substitute for meaning a certain object we know, like an apple in this case. So as soon as we realize that a reading exercise is the pattern recognition, then it's clear to understand that the, the handwriting deficiency is about the way of us creating a, a bigger gap between what, be, what we expect from a pattern and compared to what we actually wrote down. So this is the expected pattern. And this is what we actually rendered. So actual rendering. So as long as the, the gap between the two is there, then we have a difficulty reading it. And therefore, I, I like to think that improving handwriting is basically about minimizing this, the discrepancy between what we are rendering as a written word and what we actually expect from the word. And then it's also important to know what is contributing to the expectation, to the expectant, expected pattern. So what is that we expect uh, from a word to look like and why so. The expectancy is created by how we um, experience uh, the rendering of the word in the, in the first place. These renders are created in our memory and recognition system from reading the printed word, like reading books. It's uh, from reading the, um, uh, the words uh, rendered digitally on smartphones when we are reading different blogs or news or, or social media posts. So, so the letter forms used there in, on the digital devices or in a printed form, um, they inform and create the expectation about how a pattern for that word is supposed to look like. And with that said, I can suggest four types of uh, handwriting deficiencies or dysfunctions. So the first one is inconsistency of vertical elements. What I'm talking here about is that if we expect a word letter to look like this, with, within this type of uh, handwriting deficiencies, our characters could be written something like this instead. So you, you can see that there is no real consistency with how the vertical elements of each individual character um, is presented. So we are breaking the vertical lines and skew them and distort them. And therefore we create the discrepancy between what we expect from a word to look like and how it actually looks in reality. So that's the first one. The next one is something I call bloated letters. Now, this one is caused by the fact that our hands are not designed to move um, in a way that allows us to naturally create angled curves. So if we look at how our hand is moving, it's moving around uh, our joints that 
if serve as a hinge, a certain hinge. So we have this natural built-in ability to produce curved lines more than straight angled lines because that's how we are built. And therefore, when people created the printed letters like, you know, E or F or L, those kinds of letters where the preference was given to the straight lines and, and uh, sharp angles and stuff like that. It's counter natural to how our hands move. So we have this tendency of uh, kind of, kind of smooth them over and replace those angle elements with the bloated ones because that's more natural to how our hands are moving. It's more difficult and a bit counter natural for us to, you know, to move in those uh, angled shapes. But from a manufacturing perspective, maybe it was easier to produce uh, those uh, letter forms uh, for printing, but, but that, that's where we are. We try to uh, shortcut, we try to cut the corners and make it easier for ourselves. But that contributes to the bloatedness of letters and ma making it um, a bit uh, further, a look a bit further away from, uh, from uh, what we expect from a letter to look like. And then two more. The third one is inconsistency of line height and direction. And here I'm talking about something like this. That would be the expectancy. And this is what might be happening in reality. We might challenge both the direction of the line, but also its height. So it might be variable on, on, on both parameters, the direction and the value for height. And again, was that a question? No. Just, uh, yeah, just a sound in the background. And again, it's difficult for us to maintain that straight lines, probably also because of how our body is built, but that is causing the extra discrepancy. And then the final one is, um, I don't know how to call it properly, but maybe um, I would call it like loose elements. I will explain what I mean here. When we write, especially when we write uh, super fast, it's sometimes difficult to keep the elements close to each other. Like in a letter F, we might leave out the gaps. Or we start with letter E and then suddenly the, the other two remaining elements have a certain offset or letter M and so on. It's especially when we are in a hurry and we're hastily writing things down, we might be leaving out those open spaces and not connecting the elements properly together. And the problem with this is that as soon as we introduced the gap, it's a, co it's a considerable discrepancy between what, between what we expect from a letter to look like and what it looks in, in, in our final uh, rendering. So with that said, look at your initial sa sample of your handwriting that you have done in all capitals in large size. So it's easier to understand um, where you need to pay more attention and where is your area for improvement is. And just try to look at uh, your sample and then uh, upon hearing those different types of uh, the things that could contribute to a decrease in the legibility of your handwriting from the perspective of pattern recognition process, try to figure out um, 
what are the manifestations of those four dis dysfunctions, if any, you can observe and what kind of, what kind of um, thoughts or decisions uh, you might have based on that. So a couple minutes just to carefully study and maybe make some conclusions, okay? Yuri? Yes? Is this something that comes just through regular practice? <laughs> Like, yeah. is it, it's not something that, like, people are just naturally good at, right? Like, some um, people aren't just, like, naturally good or bad at writing, other than perhaps with dyslexia or dys, uh, dysnumera, which I think is the number one. Hmm. I guess so. I guess so. Because it's not probably uh, the, the intrinsic quality of uh, people to, to, to just write nicely. It's something that we need to practice and the more I do these things, uh, the less I believe in a thing like talent. I, I, I actually have uh, yeah. an increasing uh, problem with this term because I don't think there is a talent as such. I think, I think some people have better motoric skills, but uh, we are all equal after years of practice. And those who were not talented outpace the talented ones if they had more practice in their life i i, I think it's about practice mostly yeah. i figured i just know that there are people out there that talk about it as though it's a you know an unnatural talent for having good writing and i'm like no people just practice if you yes. do a lot of i mean it, it's also a problem with our digital world where we don't do as much handwriting oh, yeah. mm. i tend to think so um, I know it's a bit of a dangerous zone because we might end up in a holy war with someone who um, who strongly believes in the uh, in the concept of talent. But I I I start being quite skeptical about that uh, concept. So I I truly believe in a lot of practice that can straighten things up for you, especially when it comes to handwriting. I had a terrible handwriting in 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 the high school. And I practice years and years, and it's still not ideal, but it's much better than it was before. So I know uh, practice uh, pays off. Um, Yuri, could you place them side by side? Um, okay, I can just sacrifice my sample because you don't really need that. But I can leave out uh, these parts like that, okay? Thank you. Yeah, of course. Yep. Uh, sorry if you were about to move on. Yuri, do you have any thoughts or perhaps Susanna uh, on um, using like a slightly taller first letter, if you're gonna use all caps, using a slightly taller first letter for like the beginning of a word or a sentence? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, something like, uh, something like, uh, like this. Yes, exactly. A kind of a sentence case, but still with all the capital letters. Yes, exactly, like that. To me, it's a stylistic choice. You either do it and you do it consequently, or you don't. Yeah. Okay, thank and, you. And, and, and I think I never, I never, recommended anything um, as far as what it should be. I usually say that if, if you really think you're super terrible with handwriting and uh, you're not in the arts field and basically what you need to do is to uh, write something down on a whiteboard or a flip chart so that other people could read th uh, during a workshop or maybe you're taking the notes uh, on behalf of, of your team, then I say just go all capitals because usually what happens in those conversations, you're not going to capture a lot of text uh, like uh, a poem or poem or something like that. You're going to probably write down short sentences for decisions or maybe short sentences explaining uh, the risk or a certain concern and therefore there is no real need for elaborate handwriting in terms of uh, mixing lowercase with other styles. You just, you just fish for a speed and legibility 
and from that perspective i say just go for all capitals and but once you're confident with uh, writing in all capitals then you can explore uh, this uh, vast world of calligraphy and nice uh, um, nuanced handwriting but if you're really if you're really struggling don't just don't just uh, expose your, yourself to too much just focus on getting your capital letters straight so that other people and yourself can read it but then all of those stylistic things like starting with the big one and then uh, all capitals uh, go in uh, for the rest of, of the word. Those are stylistic and hence, I think since you're asking this question, probably you are already in, in the zone for more challenge. So I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, handing it over to Heather because she, she, would, she would definitely tell you more about uh, the journey beyond that. Uh, I, f I, I see myself when it comes to handwriting as a medic on the battlefield. I, I am not a doctor, right? But I can, I can stop bleeding and I can help you survive. <laughs> but uh, you need to talk to a doctor. <laughs> can I ask yeah. you a question, Yuri? Uh, about those uh, bloated letters, is it, uh, is it really considered as a really bad thing if, for example, you are consistent with and it's kind of like of kind of like your style that you're having, that you have more like, you know, blood of the letters instead of... I, I love this question. It uh, mm -hmm. pops up once in a while. And again, um, with, when I'm talking about these things here, um, the purpose and the goal is to make sure that what you wrote on the whiteboard or a flip chart during a conversation is easy to read. And, and notice that it is a very specific goal. And it means that you are not there to attract, you're not there to, um, to stop uh, a person's attention because you dragged uh, their, their attention and you, know, you popped up in the ocean of, of uh, other different information because they were scrolling through the Facebook. Um, and so it's different. It's a different type of, of the goal. Okay, so uh, but mm -hmm. yeah, but when it comes to styling, um, um, suddenly in the advertising, it's it's a feature because you can attract. You can just stop a person um, because you you force uh, first uh, you force the person. Um, to recognize, to spend more time on the pattern recognition, it could be a good thing in advertising, right? Because suddenly you made them think, it, it popped up. But when it comes to uh, the goal I am operating in, it's a bad thing because I'm, I don't want them to think about it. I don't want them to, um, to appreciate the style. I want them to read it so that we could talk about the same thing. Cool. It's just it's just bad in a certain context, but it mm -hmm. could be a beautiful thing in a different context. Makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. But uh, did it make any sense? I mean, did you find something interesting and new, or was that too trivial? I found it interesting. <laughs> Oh, that's quite interesting. Yeah, very good. Cool. But then um, I also hope you had uh, enough time to think about uh, your sample and maybe it helped you to look at your handwriting from a new perspective and maybe identify one or two things you could improve about this or this, uh, or, this or that letter. And if so, then I'm happy because that was more about the awareness, but also giving you an additional tool uh, to change the perspective because you are very well aware of your handwriting and, and you know whether you like it or not. That was just um, an attempt to shift it a bit for you. 